Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining today's book talk uh, featuring Chinatown Pretty by Valerie Liu and Andrea Lowe. My name is Akemi Chanimai, and I'm the program manager at Oakland Asian Cultural Center. Um, OECC's mission is to build vibrant communities through API arts and cultural programs that foster intergenerational and cross-cultural dialogue, understanding, collaboration, and social justice. And it is my great pleasure to present this event with Eastwind Books of Berkeley. And Janie from Eastwind Books will actually be moderating the Q&A after the presentation. Janie, would you like to say a few words? Thank you. Um, so thank you for the intro. Hi, everyone. My name is Janie. I work at Eastwind Books. Um, a little bit about Eastwind Books. Eastwind is an independent community bookstore in downtown Berkeley, and we specialize in Asian American and ethnic studies literature. Um, it's been up and running since 1982, and it's always been an honor and privilege to work with um, folks like Andrea and Valerie on events like this. So um, just to show everyone, Eastwind does have an event special for today's um, a featured book. So Chinatown Pretty is on sale for $22.95, and you can order online and pick up um, in store or we can ship it to you. And yeah, now, yeah, okay, back to you, Kimi. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much, Jenny. Yay, thank you so much for the discount to Eastman. That's awesome. Um, so with that, just a couple um, technical notes. So as, as some people are already doing in the chat box, please feel free to post any comments, any questions. If anything resonates with you, definitely share that out in the chat and let's get a nice conversation going as we listen to the presentation. And also questions and we will have a Q&A time to answer those. We are also recording this session and we're actually live streaming it to YouTube right now. So if you have to leave, if you missed any part of the event, you can definitely catch the recording afterwards. Um, so now without further ado, I'd like to hand it off to Valerie and Andrea. Hi everyone. Hi everybody. Thank you so much for, for joining us on this Saturday. Yeah, thank you for having us. Um, Andrea is coming in from Berkeley today. But her background says Portland Square, San Francisco. Um, and then I'm on a road trip and made a little pit stop in Portland. And I am zooming in from the Portland Chinatown Museum. Um, they are hosting us today. We're so excited to be here. Um, and before we begin, I just wanted to introduce to you Tracy Kwan, who's a board member at the Portland Chinatown Museum. Hi, everybody. We're super excited to be hosting Valerie here at the Portland Chinatown Museum. And as you can see, we're uh, actually in our space now. We are closed to the public at the moment, but we've been open since December of 2018. And we are a cornerstone in our community in the, the Portland Chinatown space, uh, where we actually are a multi-ethnic uh, location here. We uh, also encompass the Jewish quarter, the Chinatown, uh, Japantown, and we also have a, a history with the, the African American community in this space. So what we're doing here, our mission is to create a safe space to showcase the history of Chinese people in Portland, our diaspora, and also our future. We do contemporary arts in one part of our museum, and right now we're in our Beyond the Gate permanent exhibit. You can see behind us, we've got a, a historic storefront that we've restored and brought to this community. And again, we're just very excited to be hosting Valerie here. Uh, today's Portland Chinatown is very interesting because we now have a, an urban apparel vibe. There are several stores here that sell to sneaker heads and you know, Nike's vibrant culture is uh, very alive in Portland. So uh, our Chinatown is changing, but we are definitely hoping to maintain a cornerstone uh, community here for Chinese people and folks like Valerie coming in to do contemporary arts. So yeah, very welcome to our space whenever we open back up. Nice to see you all. Valerie? Thanks again, uh, Portland Chinatown Museum for having us. And I think that's one of the best things about this project is that we got to travel to so many different Chinatowns and we're constantly you know, visiting new ones. So really excited to be here in Portland and check our Instagram stories today. We'll be kind of exploring different you know, restaurants and tea houses and gardens. 
Awesome. Um, well, thanks again to Oakland Asian Cultural Center and East Wind Books for hosting us and the Portland Chinatown Museum, of course. Um, yeah, this is um, awesome because East Wind is actually located in Berkeley where I live and I went to undergrad at UC Berkeley. So uh, they've been an institution um, in terms of bookstores for most of my adult life. So I really appreciate that they um, reached out to us. Um, we're gonna do a short presentation on the project, kind of an overview and show you guys some photos. And then we'll do a reading from the Oakland chapter of our book. Great. Um, but yeah, I'm Valerie, Valerie Liu, I'm the writer behind the project. And I'm Andrea Lowe, the photographer. And uh, the way we got started with this project is that when Andrea and I would go on dim sum dates in Chinatown, we noticed that the seniors had a very interesting and distinct aesthetic that consisted, consisted of a lot of florals, clashing patterns, bright colors um, and layers, lots and lots of them. It was head turning and it was unexpected. Like who would have guessed a papa or grandma would be wearing a Supreme hat with a two piece pajama set and uh, a puffy jacket, which definitely inspired my outfit for today. <laughs> oh, since 2014, we've been photographing and chatting up seniors in historic Chinatowns um, all over North America, including San Francisco Bay Area, where we started, um, Oakland, SF, LA, Chicago, Vancouver, and New York. And through hundreds of encounters, what we've learned is that asking these seniors about their clothes is a gateway to learn more about their lives. And the way we do that is just starting out with like, where, asking them, where is this from? Uh, one of the first people we met was Monta. Um, I, I was lucky to live in Chinatown for six months and um, I would see her get off the bus as people went downtown to work in the financial district, you would see um, seniors getting off the bus to go up Pacific to go grocery shopping. And the first thing I noticed were her jade shoes, as you can see here. Um, but yeah, she kind of became our, our Chinatown pretty Cinderella. Um, I first saw her on the street and then eventually we met her for the project and now she's the, the cover person for our book. And this is Xi Ping, photographed in San Francisco and she was really proud um, to tell us that everything she was wearing had been gifted to her. Um, so like many seniors we meet, um, they're really resourceful and they value reusing and repurposing everything, including hand-me-downs. So it begins with the clothes, like clothes are kind of the gateway to learning more about their immigration stories and where they're from. So we asked them, where were you born? What did you do before you retired? Um, and this is Dorothy Kwok. She was born and raised in San Francisco Chinatown and lived in SRO housing uh, with sometimes up to, that's single residency occupancy housing with sometimes up to 10 people in one room. Her father for work delivered um, these huge 50 pound, 50 and 100 pound sacks of rice around Chinatown. And so she would collect these um, kind of linen bags and she crafted this really special dress out of some of those heirloom rice sacks actually. So um, in doing so, she's carrying on her family history in her clothing. And then this is Ms. Lee, who we met in um, Manhattan Chinatown. Um, she was standing in front of the Chinese Community Center on Mott Street. And before moving to the US five years ago, she had worked as a park gardener in Hong Kong on trees big and small, she said. Um, she misses the weather back in Guangzhou. And uh, it's not just about their history, it's really celebrating the independent lives they lead as seniors in these urban centers. So we like to ask them what they're doing, what they're up to, what their daily lives are like. And here we have the Jungs. Uh, we met them in LA. And um, staying physically active is really important to a lot of seniors, including them. Uh, Mrs. Zhang actually impressively has been teaching a Chinese exercise routine at her local Chinatown park every morning for the past 20 years. I'm lucky if I could do yoga once a week, so that's pretty impressive. Um, and then this is CP who we met uh, getting groceries on Canal Street. It was kind of a rainy day and she smartly protected her purse with um, the iconic thank you bag. 
which is very smart. So at the end of our encounters, we ask the seniors to share any wisdoms, um, like what's your, what are your tips for longevity? What's your secret to a fulfilling life? Mrs. Yang gave us one of the most beautiful pieces of advice. Um, we met her at the YWCA, which is an affordable housing complex in San Francisco, um, Chinatown. And she said growing up, she was a perfectionist. Um, but now that she has Alzheimer's, she kind of, you know, she remembers things sometimes. Um, but oftentimes, like, she couldn't tell us where she came from or what her immigration story was like. And she said, hey, listen, my kids are okay. My grandkids are okay. I have been some with my friends. Um, so if you know, I can remember, that's great. If I don't, that's all right too. And this is Buck Chu in San Francisco. Uh, we ran into him while he was out running errands and he was just juggling <laughs> this huge armful of bok choy and fresh ginger. And he's actually, it's hard, it's hard to believe, but he's 96 in this photo. And um, when we took the picture, he, gave us all these tips on healthy eating for longevity. And aside from our, you know, standard questions, one thing we always try to do is check the socks. Always check the socks. Um, because usually it will reveal a, de a delightful surprise. Like it makes that awesome outfit even more awesome. Um, like this woman who we met in Ross Alley, which is one of the most magical alleyways in San Francisco Chinatown. Her socks read, my favorite salad is wine. Um, so here we are. Um, yeah, we've gotten to meet hundreds of seniors over the past several years and we're really touched by them sharing their experiences with us and their life stories. Um, and we just are, the book is actually dedicated to them. And uh, we just wanna end with Mr. Wu in his iconic red suit. Um, he said, you know, when you're young, you don't have to care about fashion, but when you're old, you have to. And uh, definitely doing this project, it made me care a lot about fashion. Um, so yeah, thank you for listening to our talk and for you know being interested in our project. And then uh, next, we're just going to read a chapter from um, our a piece from our Oakland chapter from the book. Um, so in Chinatown Pretty Book, we went to a few different cities: went to LA, Vancouver, uh, New York, Chicago, San Francisco, and then we went to the Chinatown across the bay um, in Oakland. And uh, yeah, whenever we're there, it's super sunny and really busy. And um, in Oakland is one of like a, one of the most special people that we've met. And so Andrea will kick us off on Estelle Kelly. So we met Estelle actually at um, 41 Ross when we were having a senior portrait day there. And that's, in, that's um, an art space in San Francisco Chinatown, but she lives in Oakland. So she, uh, so we've gone to visit her at her home. And so um, you'll see that She's wearing different outfits um, in this next, the next, the slides coming up because we um, photographed her at her, at her home. But, um, all right, let's, we got my book here. Um, so this is Estelle Kelly. A regal air preceded Estelle when she walked into a senior portrait day we hosted at 41 Ross. She's Chinatown pretty from a different time and place. So you can see her outfit is this mix of like contemporary. She had this um, white plaid coat on and, and lots of really beautiful jewelry like this jade pendant and um, bracelet. And yeah, so it's a, this really lovely mix of new and old. She said, I don't dress like an old lady. I'm 87, but I don't feel like it. Mrs. Kelly was born at San Francisco Chinese Hospital in 1929. When she was still a baby, her family moved back to China. Um, so when she's back in China, her parents get divorced and remarried and neither of them really wanna bring her and her sister into their new life. So she and her sister are pretty much orphans and they, she has this really fuzzy childhood from that time. Um, and when she's nine, she's actually sent back to San Francisco by boat to live with um, these various aunts in San Francisco. Um, so, 
As the second Sino-Japanese War devastated China, she was sent back by boat at age nine along with her sister to live among her six aunts in San Francisco. One or two nights at a time with whomever took us in, she said. Every day was different. I didn't know where I was going to stay. We slept where we were told to sleep. For a year, she attended school and at the old location of St. Mary's Cathedral Chinese Mission in Stockton Street. They were teaching me English, but I had no idea, she said. I was just following my cousins. She only understood Chinese, so she felt lost at school. I wasn't learning, she said. Most of her life, Estelle felt like she had no idea what was being said, and there was no one to explain what was happening to her in Chinese or in English. One day at age 11, she was taken to the Ming Huang Home, an orphanage for Chinese girls on Ninth and Fallon, where Lake Merritt BART Station stands today. She remembered being driven over and dropped off at the home. No one told me this is where you're going to stay. The orphanage, despite its shortcomings, provided her with structure. They ate breakfast, prayed, and then went to public school. I was happy, not happy, she corrected herself, content. Her sister, who she wasn't really close to, also ended up at the orphanage because she didn't get along with their stepmother, whom she'd been living with. Even though Mrs. Kelly had lived in the Bay Area for years, she had never understood English. She overcame her language barrier unexpectedly after spending six months at the home. All of a sudden, I understood English, she said. We were eating one morning and someone said, please pass the butter. And I understood what she said. Uh, Ming Kuang also served as a vocational training program. When girls turned 15, the home would, quote, turn you out and send girls to live with middle-class Oakland families as housemaids, all while going to high school full-time. So um, her daily life at the time, like, consisted of waking up, waking up pretty early at six, feeding the kids, then getting ready to go to high school. Um, and then she, right after school, she would come back cook dinner, take care of kids, clean. And then um, she said, if you're lucky, you would get everything done by 8 p.m. By that time, I was so tired. I just wanted to go to bed. From there, it was nightmare until I was 22. So after she graduated high school, she got married and had a child um, and then had to work. And at times she had to board out her daughter, which meant that she had to give her daughter to another family to take care of her, her, her kid while she worked. Um, and that's when she started, got started with her dancing career. When she was 21, she met producers from Forbidden City, a Chinese nightclub and cabaret that operated from 1938 to 1970 on Sutter and Grant in San Francisco. It featured Asian singers, musicians, dancers, even acrobats and magicians. They were looking for dancers and when she tried out, she didn't even have any experience. You have rhythm, they told her, and she got the job. Mrs. Kelly said that famous people would roll through Forbidden City whenever they were in town. Ronald Reagan, John Wayne, Bob Hope, and other celebrities of that era. She worked there for 12 years, leaving once in a while to work at other clubs. I don't remember anything from when I was 22 to 27, she says. I was a single mom dancing in the 1950s everything was upside down. There she um, met her second husband and had another child. And then eventually um, she, in her mid thirties, she got out of that industry and worked at an insurance company until she retired and um, married Bob, her third husband, who she's still with. She gave us some advice. She said, people shouldn't get married until after 35, she said, reflecting back on her life. At that time, you establish your work, what you want to do with your life. So a few years after meeting with Mrs. Kelly at 41 Ross, we photographed her in her Oakland home. Her closet was filled with elastic waist pants in every color, suitcases filled with sequin dance costumes. Although she retired from Chinese cabarets, she never gave up dancing. She still performs with seven others in her namesake group, the Stell Kelly Performing Arts Group. They sing and dance at retirement homes. I like to sing and dance. I don't know what I'll be doing, she said. It's a part of me. So um, Estelle's granddaughter, Kelsey, actually provided some of these old photos of her, which um, are pretty amazing. So you can see the Forbidden City, the nightclub on the left here. And um, 
some of her costumes from the time. That's such a wild era. I can't imagine it would, what it would, what it was, what it was like. Um, and what's really special about Estelle Kelly is that, you know, we were able to meet her on a few different occasions, sit in her home and hear her life story. And as you could tell, it was really rough. She went through a lot. Um, I think the line where she says like, I learned, I realized I learned English the day I heard, please pass the butter and understood it. And it wasn't, most of her childhood was just fuzzy. Like she kind of followed her cousins around everywhere, went to school, but didn't know what was going on. Um, so we really appreciate Estelle Kelly and her family for being open and sharing this little window into what life was like. Um, so yeah, that's one of the, like the longer profiles that we have in the book um, is Estelle Kelly. But yeah, that's uh, that's Oakland. And then I think we're ready probably for some Q&A. Awesome, thank you so much for sharing that part of the book and going through all these amazing photographs. Um, we will now take questions from the audience. So please use the chat function in Zoom to submit your questions for Valia, Valerie, Valerie and Andrea, or if you'd like to share any comments with us. But I think to kick it off, um, I have a question. So um, you have worked in six different cities for more than six years. Um, how have you seen, if you've seen, the effects of gentrification vary across um, the different Chinatowns and if you've seen it impact any of the seniors that you've met and interacted with? That's a great question. Um, I think we'll start at home in San Francisco, Chinatown, kind of where we started the project. I think seeing the work that organizations have done, like Chinatown Community Development Center, to preserve affordable housing and to advocate for people and merchants and storefronts. Um, you know, I think our Chinatown is pretty still serving like the Chinatown population, the Chinese population. Um, when we traveled to other places like LA, we saw more of a mix of like newer kind of hip businesses, more trendy shops. And I think a lot of the community groups there are worried about gentrification or fighting it back against that and experience that a bit more. Um, but yeah, it varies from Chinatown to Chinatown. Um, but I think traveling around made us realize kind of like the hard work that goes into either protecting or lobbying or advocating for the people that use and live in Chinatown. So yeah, it varies by city. Great. Um, I don't know if Andrea, you wanted to answer that as well? Yeah, thank you back off of what Valerie said. I think, yeah, wonderful thing about this project is meeting in every city that we went to, all six cities. We partnered with and met with the various nonprofits that are really fighting and doing on the ground work to protect Chinatown as a livable neighborhood, not just a tourist destination. So we really got to see, um, yeah, we really got to see like the work that they're doing. And it's it's a lot just to make it, um, to provide social services, to make the neighborhood um, really like a place where um, seniors can walk to places, access fresh food and whatnot. So um, I've heard that in cities that have, that don't have such strong organization, um, you know, the Chinatowns tend to kind of fall to more being like um, a place for tourists or visitors and, um, I think San Francisco has a good mix of both. Um, and yeah, working with CCDC and um, all the various nonprofits in those cities was um, really enlightening to see. That's something that I was not so aware of before I started the project. Great, thank you. Um, so we have a question from Rosalind. How has your experience interviewing Chinatown seniors influenced your own hopes and vision for your golden years? Thanks, Rose. Thanks, Rose. <laughs> um, I think for me personally, or you know, I think another great thing we've learned through this project is how active these seniors are. So they are, we call them sort of the best city dwellers in a way because they're out there taking public transit, walking everywhere. Um, buying fresh vegetables every morning, they shop local, um, they use parks um, 
like an extension of their living room. They're out there exercising, meeting with friends. So they're really using the city in like a, a very active way. They're activating city spaces. Um, and I think that's seen seniors live so independently in San Francisco Chinatown and other Chinatowns too. That's been an inspiration, I think, just to remain really active um, and yeah, and just like out there taking care of yourself. I think that's, um, that's something I aspire to for sure. That kind of reminds me of Jeannie Fong who we met in LA Chinatown. She runs kind of a gift shop. She was like, I could live with my kids, you know, in probably the suburbs. But she's like, that would be boring. And like, I have the shop and I get to see people and I get to walk around and do things on my own accord. Um, so yeah, just their independent spirit and also like their posture. Whenever I meet like a Chinatown senior and I see them with like, you know, their like posture and like so dignified, it reminds me to straighten my back as well. Awesome, thank you. That's so funny about the posture, just remembering me to straighten my back. <laughs> Everyone's uh, straighten your backs right now. <laughs> cool, so uh, we have another question from Kat. Did you resonate with any of the seniors' fashion sense? Can you see yourself wear any of their outfits? I think I only see myself wearing their outfits now. Um, we talk about this a lot. I think when we started the project six years ago, I wore all black pretty much in my throughout my 20s. But I think after a few years of doing Chinatown Pretty, I saw how much joy it brought me to see, you know, six floral patterns in one outfit or like um, funny, you know, socks with like dogs playing soccer on them. Um, and so I've definitely integrated that into my wardrobe, hence the pink puffy jacket today. Over the years, um... I definitely think less about matching. I think it's less important. Now, I think it just works so well on, seeing it works so well on Chinatown seniors. Um, I think I just kind of grab stuff in the morning and put it on. I don't really think about coordinating and it's liberating. I, I highly, I highly recommend it. But yeah, I think also seeing how resourceful they are. They, um, they keep their clothes for decades. You know, a lot of it they made. Um, and, Maybe to someone our age, it looks vintage, but it's really just their clothes they've had for so long. So um, that's also insp inspiring, I think, to um, you know buy secondhand or just mix and match. I think clothes, rediscover clothes um, that you already have in your closet. Thank you. Um, Lori asked or said, I'm from SF Chinatown, so I appreciate this project. Did you get a sense that the seniors are financially stable in their housing, food stores, and et cetera? I know that with COVID, there's been a lot of energy around getting food and resources out to Chinatown seniors. So there's been extra food pantries and hot food prep. Um, but yeah, and I also think there's a really beautiful story that I think I heard on NPR or something, or and also a New York Times article about how the doctors in Chinatown when they first heard about COVID, they were like, oh my God, it, the flight's like only 12 hours or whatever. And they they anticipated it and made sure to protect the people in Chinatown. So that's a really moving story just about how the doctors and the organizations were kind of like planning ahead and also providing sort of resources throughout all of COVID. I also want to um, welcome people to ask questions to Portland Chinatown Museum if you have any questions about Pacific Northwest, Chinese history. Okay, so um, Anne also asked, how did you all communicate with the seniors when listening and asking about their stories? Um, she also said, my Chinese is so bad. Same here. Yes, um, same here. <laughs> so Valerie and I, we, um, neither of us are fluent in Cantonese. And so Cantonese and Toisan, or Toisan um, are the languages most common in the Chinatowns in the US, so Toisanese. So we work with translators in each of the cities. And so there's usually three of us when we go out, um, we go out for a shoot, there'll be um, Valerie, me and the translator. And so they were really instrumental in making this project happen. 
Valerie does speak um, Vietnamese though. So um, occasionally we, we would meet a Vietnamese senior and she would be the one to speak with them and interview them. Awesome. I, I always get really flustered when having to go to the grocery store to buy something for myself without my mom because my Chinese is the vocabulary of a five-year-old. Um, but that's great. So Ian asked, curious around valuing labor and stories, have or will the elders be interview elders interviewed through this project be compensated, especially as gentrification and COVID impacts them more directly? And or what will proceeds from the books be used for? That's a great question. Um, you know, we definitely wanted to contribute to Chinatowns as part of this project. So uh, we have a link on our website to our bookshop page. We have an affiliate account and 100% of our affiliate proceeds go to different Chinatown um, organizations each month. Awesome. Okay, so we have another question. There's more filling the chat now. Have any of these seniors spoken about brutality or hostility they or others know experienced as a result of COVID? Um, we did the majority of our book over the last six years before COVID hit. So ever since coronavirus happened, we haven't been out in the streets. Um, I haven't heard anything personally, but you know, there have been accounts in the news, but yeah, nothing through kind of like our sources. Cool. Okay. Um, so Dave asks, thank you for executing this project. How much did the seniors, how much did the seniors wear what they wore due to financial restraints and what was available to them versus consciously putting the outfit together? Um, let's see. So I think there is um, a common value that we see in Chinatown amongst seniors, especially is um, I think thriftiness and resourcefulness. So to answer your question, I think it's sort of ingrained in Chinese culture, um, reusing and repurposing as we were mentioning. So it's hard for us to know what people's financial situations are, but I think um, a lot of it does come from that cultural value of, of taking care of your clothes and wearing them for as long as you have them. And a lot of the clothes were made by the people who wear them because they may have, I think that was a skill that was just more common in their generation. And also so many of them worked at as seamstresses in factories upon, upon immigrating because it was the one of the few jobs they could get without knowing English. So, um, so all of these factors kind of contribute to the style we see of um, wearing different eras and having, yeah, this mix and match of eras and mix and match of handmade and new and um, gifted clothing. Thank you. So we have another question um, asked, did the seniors you talked to ever talk about moving either out of Chinatown at some point or to another Chinatown in another city? Or did the majority of them see themselves staying put and what were their reasons? I think um, the people we talk to are happy to live in Chinatown. Um, some of the people we talk to, not all, um, because these are like, this is street style photography. So a lot of interactions are just very short. It's like the five minutes we get before they go onto the bus with their grocery haul. Um, but some people are like, you know, they could live with their kids in the suburbs, um, but they like to be in the middle of things where they can see their friends in the park, go see their doctor, get groceries, go get some coffee and buns um, without having to depend on anyone else. Yeah, that's something we would hear from multiple people is that they <laughs> feel like they'd be pretty bored if they moved in with their children who live in the suburbs, even though they would have grandchildren there. I think a lot of them, yeah, they, they mentioned they would be pretty bored because they would pretty much just stay inside and um, watch TV. So they really value their independence too. Great. Yeah, I think I feel like 
whenever I'm in Chinatown, I get a sense or I feel a sense of community among the seniors. Um, great. Uh, so uh, someone asked, were any of the seniors giving portraits? Yes. So um, after we meet them and and talk to them and if they oblige um, <laughs> a photo, uh, we do collect. It's important for us um, and for this project for them to kind of understand what we're doing. And so we collect their info and we'll send them uh, physical prints of, um, of their portraits. So it's a nice thank you and it's a nice keepsake for them. Um, for sharing their time with us. Awesome. Um, so Catherine asks, what do you wish that the average person or American understood better about Chinatowns? I think I wish people visited more often. Um, you know, China, with COVID, you know, we've been indoors for a really long time, but Chinatowns are still active. There's still grocery stores open, restaurants, cafes. Um, parks. And so I think it's, I wish people knew that, you know, it's a place where people live, that is a central part to their existence and their social life. And that, um, you know, would love our involvement as well as patrons and as people that appreciate the architecture or the food and the merchants and the residents. So I would say like visit, visit Chinatown, give it some love. Yeah, support small local businesses, um, especially during COVID. Um, so Tara asked, has this project affected or changed how the two of you approach the physical areas and cities, or more specifically Chinatowns? Yeah, for Chinatown, I think it's, I was so drawn to it um, initially, even before we started this project. And I think Valerie, probably has something similar to say is that it doesn't feel, it's not China and it's not quite America. It's something sort of this in-between space. And as an Asian American who hears lots of Cantonese like with my family and grew up eating both American and Chinese food, it's just a place that I kind of feels really comfortable to me, um, but um, I'm not quite a part of because I don't speak Chinese. So in a way, like I love going there just to walk around and just, I always loved people watching there. There's just like so much to see. So it's sort of this comforting place to me. Um, no matter what city I'm in, I always try to see if they have, if they have their own Chinatown. It might just be a block or so, or just like a few Chinese restaurants even, but I always love to check that out wherever I travel. And yeah, because it feels they're all around, they feel they're all unique and different, but there is this commonality between all of them. So um, yeah, it's some, it's a place I seek out now. Same, um, I was just driving from Montana to here and stopped by Butte, Montana, which has, I think the oldest continually running um, Chinese restaurant, Pekin Noodle Parlor. Um, but yeah, kind of echoing what Andrea said, Chinatowns feel like home, whether it's SF Bay Area or you're traveling to a new place, there's familiar sights and sounds, some different, some kind of similar, but um, I love the sound of Cantonese. I love seeing seniors out and about. So yeah, I just love going to Chinatowns. Thank you. Um, another question asked, was there an elder um, who didn't make it into the book and you wished you could have included him or her? Will there be a follow-up book? Well, there are so many people we saw around Chinatown that we did not get to meet or who declined the photo. Um, um, yeah, there's probably for every person that made it into the book, there's probably nine others that we were um, just sort of amazed by, but, but they weren't, they weren't open to being photographed, which is totally fine. Um, but yeah, this project has been pretty tricky because our usual, I guess, success rate for, um, interviewing and taking a photograph is about 10%. So maybe one out of 10 people will, will agree to the photo taking. That's kind of the trickiest part is, is getting the picture. Um, 
So yeah, we actually call the people that we <laughs> that we kind of admire from a distance but have rejected us. Basically, we call them our unicorns. So we'll see them around Chinatown too. Like whenever we go to San Francisco, there's always one or two walking around that are just maybe too shy or too private to um, participate, but we can admire them from a distance. It feels like a physical heartbreak. Like when, whenever they say, say no, we're like, no, you look so good. Yeah, it is, it is pretty heartbreaking. <laughs> but it, le it leaves room for, for book two. <laughs> I like the positivity. <laughs> When you get rejected that often and so frequently, you yeah, you have to look at the positive side. Thank you. Um, Jen asks, I've always wondered about Chinatown seniors' affinity towards puffy vest. Did you gain any insight into this? It's lightweight and it's warm. <laughs> yeah. Functional. Yeah. This is a great question. Yeah, and it's, essential. it's essential now that we're eating and hanging out outside. I'm like perusing new puffy jackets to get for this fall winter season. Yeah, utility is um, is rules Chinatown fashion. I would say that is above all else the most important factor in driving the style. So that's why you see lots of. Um, like sun cover bonnets and visors and um, sometimes arm sleeves and and yeah just tons of layering to stay warm so I mean even look at Andrea's background you see like at least oh that's a really wide brim one like different degrees of wide brimness layers vests comfortable shoes mm -hmm. chin straps that they'll sew in themselves to kind of make the, the clothing work better for them. There's a lot of customization and hand sewing and tweaking of clothes. Awesome, there's a lot of thriftiness I see. Um, so you have inspired folks like Esther to go to Oakland Chinatown right after this. Um, Akimi asked, I'm curious to hear if other Chinatowns also have a museum like Portland Chinatown Museum that is dedicated to preserving its history and legacy as these neighborhoods are being encroached by development. How might one help preserve local history if those institutions aren't yet present in the community? Uh, in San Francisco, we have 41 Ross and the CCC, the Chinese Cultural Center, that always have exhibits that explore Chinatowns and what does it mean to be Asian American or Chinese American. And there's a new exhibit up right now um, at 41 Ross. There's also in San Francisco, the Chinese Historical Society, um, CHSA, and they have a museum that focuses around Chinese American culture and uh, yeah, Chinese history in America. So a broader, um, it's a broader theme, but they're located, um, what street is that? It's right in the heart of Chinatown on Clay Street. Cool, and then I think Portland Chinatown Museum will, will say a few words about that too, since they run an institution. Hi, I'm Sarah Chung. I'm one of the board directors here at the Portland Chinatown Museum. Thank you for uh, having us here uh, today. Um, we're following a lot of other institutions that have been established. Um, the closest one to us is the Wing Luke Museum up in Seattle, uh, in the uh, Seattle's International District. And uh, they are also exploring the uh, Asian history of, of the, their neighborhood. Um, I just recently was on a Zoom with the, the, I think it was called the Chinese American Museum in Washington, DC. They have not opened yet. They, um, when COVID hit that, that stopped them from uh, progressing any further, but they were established, I understand very recently. So that's a, exciting addition to the DC area. And uh, we've uh, also been um, uh, connected with the, uh, the MOCA in New York, Museum of the Chinese American History in New York. And, um, so there are, there is definitely much interest uh, for this kind of history. And what we're hoping is that we can add to 
the uh, fabric of uh, American history, which is not just white uh, Western European or ethnocentric. It, it, it's all these different uh, uh, cultures. And as Tracy mentioned here in Portland Chinatown, even though our footprint is uh, getting smaller and smaller due to uh, social reasons, um, we have a lot of social service centers here uh, in the immediate area. It's the oldest part of the west side of Portland. So that's always been a challenge. And, uh, um, but uh, a lot of the uh, businesses and the organizations um, are committed to remaining here. We have, um, we're very proud of the fact that we have a, uh, um, the Yet Sing Music Club, which was a music and opera club that was established here in Portland in the uh, late thirties. And it still is a continuing presence they're not a professional group, but they're like a uh, interest group that brings in um, Chinese musicians and opera singers, and they still practice twice a week here in uh, in our Portland Chinatown. Um, uh, as mentioned before, the Chinese uh, Consolidated Benevolent Association building is across the street from us. They were able to buy that building or have it built in 1911. So they're one of the, they have historical status. And for us here, we are in the middle of a uh, uh, designated historical um, community. We are known as the uh, New Chinatown, Japantown historical site. So that was something that the uh, park system has given to us. And so um, our challenges of course, is that we um, have to live within the, limitations of that um, and uh, but we're proud to be in this area and we're proud to be a cornerstone of this community thank you thank you so visit your local museums because it gives you the the context in which chinatowns are built awesome thank you so much so we have two last questions um Jeannie asked, what inspired you and how long did it take for you to complete the project? And also, since um, you mentioned CCDC, did you enter any SRO to interview anyone from SF Chinatown? But yeah, this project started because Andrea and I, you know, would spend time in Chinatown. We both kind of had the same reaction whenever we saw a papa wearing a next level outfit pass us. We would just be like, <gasps> Did you see that? Oh my God, where'd she get her shoes? And um, it was kind of born out of that desire to understand where she got her shoes and how she thought this outfit um, or came up with this outfit. But then from there it evolved to tell me about your life, what's your immigration story? And then furthermore, it was like about, you know, why are Chinatowns important and how can we, what can we do to kind of document the wonderful people that live here and the wonderful neighborhood that they live in? Yeah, we started um, the project in 2014. And so we've been working on it for about, yeah, at least six years. Um, the book was probably two and a half years, Valerie. Um, so before that, we uh, were doing some photo exhibits with the Chinatown Community Development Center, the nonprofit we mentioned in San Francisco. And uh, we were blogging stories and they had an Instagram, but the book kind of came about a couple years ago. And to answer your question, did we enter any SROs? Um, I remember going into some <laughs> right in Chinatown and um, it was really fascinating to see the spaces because they often have a communal kitchen, like there's one kitchen and maybe um, a group bathroom per floor. So it's sort of like akin to maybe more dorm housing. And then um, oftentimes an entire family will live in in a bedroom, which is quite, in a room, which is quite small. Um, and the nonprofit CCDC actually manages a lot of those buildings. So when we visit um, some of our senior friends in Chinatown, um, yeah, it's interesting to see their setup and, and how they live. Um, there's a big, uh, there's a pretty big range of what the apartments and the housing look like. Some are more like apartments and some are more the SRO style. Um, yeah. yeah but I, six years is a long time. What's that? Six years is a long time. But yeah. I was kind of reflecting on it the other night, like how 
you know, that excitement Andrea and I first felt when we, we would see these grandmas, like I still feel, and we, we, we did the project not knowing where it was going to go because we were just so excited and, and wanted to learn more about them and their stories. And, and then meeting organizations like CCDC kind of instilled like a, a mission or a purpose. Um, mm -hmm. And then just creating more relationships and also hearing the audiences, you know, or the readers reactions. Um, gave us a lot of like reinforcement and energy to continue this project. So I think it's all just like all the relationships between the seniors and the nonprofits and the readers that like just made this project continue for six years. Great, thank you. And we have our last question from Elizabeth asking, how did you choose which Chinatowns to include in your project? Did you notice any differences in style depending on the region? Do they either the Chinatown the seniors currently lived in or the area of China from which they came from? To answer, um, that's a good question. How did we choose the Chinatowns? Um, so I think we kind of did, we did some research around which Chinatowns had the largest populations or were the most established, which had been um, around the longest and and so I think that's where we that's where we landed. And Vancouver um, is a place we've both been to. And Valerie had a personal connection there because her grandma, her step grandma, lived there. Um, so that was our our one that was outside of the states. And in terms of like clothing differences, um, you know, you would see the kind of Chinatown pretty aesthetic, which is a kind of patchwork of different textures and eras and patterns and colors throughout all the different Chinatowns. Um, I would say that San Francisco probably has the most of that because of our weather. You know, there's a lot of microclimates. It's constantly changing with fog coming in or sun shining through, or you might get hot as you're walking up a hill with like a bunch of oranges in your hands. Um, so that just adds more layers to the layers. Um, so yeah, China, I think San Francisco kind of exemplifies that, but you could see that everywhere. Thank you so much. And I think I just wanted to uplift a lot of the love that the chat is giving you all. Um, so thank you for sharing all these resources to elevate our Chinatowns and keeping this history alive and capturing all these um, histories and sharing all these stories. Um, so thank you so much. Um, I know Chinatown pretty is pretty near and dear to my heart as I grew up in Chinatown. It's really amazing to see um, all these seniors captured um, in these photographs and stories. So I think to close us out, um, I'll hand it over to Akimi. Yeah, thank you so much, Janie, for being an awesome moderator. And also thank you, Valerie and Andrea, um, for sharing these wonderful stories. And just I know it's just a taste of what's in this actual book. So please, I hope everyone can grab their own copy because um, it's just incredible, the stories and the photos that you shared with us today. So with that, um, you'll notice in the chat, we are posting some follow-up links. So um, I encourage everyone, if you do think of more questions or you want to follow the next adventures of Chinatown Pretty, um, their Instagram handle and their website are in there. Uh, for OACC side, we have um, a really interesting uh, panel event actually next Saturday on the 24th called Oakland Chinatown today and tomorrow. So um, if this is a topic and this is a neighborhood that's near and dear for you, uh, greatly encourage you to join us again next Saturday. Um, also, it would be wonderful if you can um, fill out an event survey, let us know what was great. Um, let us know if you have suggestions for how we can improve um, our virtual events since we do we, we anticipate this to be the format for um, for the near future um, for a little bit. So with that, um, I just want to, again, thank you all for joining us uh, on this weekend. Um, it really means a lot to see so much support for our Chinatowns. And so I want to wish you all a great weekend. Um, please stay cool if you're <laughs> in a heat wave um, and take care. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for having us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. And if you want to purchase a copy of Chinatown Pretty, <laughs> it's available at Eastman Books. Uh, we have a special discount for it. And yeah, I just wanted to send special thanks to Valerie and Andrea and OACC for partnering with Eastman Books um, 
yeah, thank you everyone for all the community support um, to help Eastwind um, keep Eastwind up and running. And yes, feel free to go check out our website for more events and also to get a copy of Chinatown Pretty because I know I will be getting one. And go to Chinatowns and tell some grandmas or grandpas they look good today. <laughs> Absolutely.